All right. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, perfect, thank you. Uh, I propose we start now. I don't know if there are so many people coming, but we're due, so I'll just kickstart this lesson. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sylvette van der Straat, and I am from the Tweebergen uh, Library. And I'm here today to give you a course on building a search strategy. This lesson will be recorded, just so you know, um, so that students that are sick or anything can have access to it, and so you guys afterwards also have access to this presentation. So, what is the big subject? What are we going to talk about today? It's how you can find scientific literature. And just to get an idea as a starting point, um, please raise your hands. Who of you looks for literature in Limo? Just a raise of hands, don't worry, there are no cameras pointing towards you, so... Like, what, a third? A, a quarter, something like that? Okay, thanks. Who uses Google? More people, right. Specifically Google Scholar? Most of you. Um, who uses Google but not Google Scholar, for example? Does that happen sometimes? Not really? Okay, thanks. Um, Web of Science, anyone? Yeah. <laughs> One or two um, courageous people using Web of Science. It's good to know. Uh, IEEE Explorer? <coughs> bit more? Okay, thanks. Um, and now a bit more specific questions on database searching. Who has ever opened or used an advanced search function in a database? A few people? Okay. Um, Boolean operators while searching? Know of them? Use them already? Yeah, not many people. Um, truncation wildcards? Anyone know what it is using it? Not really. Okay, that's good. So you'll still learn something useful, hopefully, in this course. Um, what is the point? Why are we here today? Um, first question, what is a search strategy? Yeah, it's the, the, the main thing that you're going to learn about today. So search strategy, it's the principle of an organized uh, structure of key terms that's used to search a database. Why do we specify database? Huh? In the uh, olden days, before uh, the internet was available and very usable, app, uh, researchers used to go to the library and search for journals to find articles. Huh? Um, that long and uh, exhausting process has now been kind of made easier with databases and other sources of literature online, thankfully. Um, so that's what we're about to learn. We'll also focus mainly on finding literature online through databases because I think that's the most relevant for you guys, right? And the point is this to retrieve information in these databases and other sources of literature. Um, so the goal of having a search strategy uh, is to find a relevant literature. It can be to find background information on your topic, but it can also be to find an overview of uh, the previously published work, sometimes all the previously published work, if you want to do a review or some kind, um, to really not only get just background information, but have a really, really good idea of what the current state uh, of the science is on your specific topic. Um, and you can also use it, of course, to argue your hypothesis um, as a researcher. Now, why is it so important that you are able to make a good search strategy? Um, this is an example article. Uh, it, it's been published in Biological Conservation, and the title is Worldwide, Worldwide Decline of the Entomofauna, a review of its drivers. Entomofauna are insects, for those who are wondering, and it's a paper that's been published in 2019, so not too long ago, um, and there has been a big noise about it in the media, uh, worldwide, a lot of journals took that title and were like, oh, we're doomed, the insects are dying out. Um, but then if you look at the methodology of this review paper, they've specifically used, uh, using the keywords insect and decline and survey. There's a really big problem with this methodology. And that's the fa fact that if you look for decline, you will only find decline in a database. Huh? The, the um, output of a computer system is only as good as your own input. I guess you guys know that better than me. So, 
In this case, they haven't searched at all for literature that might indicate an um, increase of entomofauna or even a, a, st a stay-even situation. So if your search strategy is not correct, might have big implications on the accuracy of your work. Um, and of course, this has been highlighted by some other articles to, um, I guess, state that and to have some comments on the first published work. Um, so that's, that was a very, very biased study, let's say. Uh, An other example that might be even more um, Grave, let's say, is that there's, there has been a Viagra trial for, fetus growth, uh, for fetal growth restriction that has been halted because it has resulted in baby death. Um, sounds quite ominous. It is quite ominous, which means that some pregnant women took Viagra as a trial to see um, to help some problem, and uh, a lot of the fetuses died during the, this trial. And um, they found out that if the people starting the trial had researched the literature a bit more, more thoroughly at the start, um, they might have found some animal studies that indicated this problem already. Huh? So had they searched the literature properly, this could have most definitely been avoided. So a few reasons why having a, a really good uh, literature search is really important uh, to be able to make good science and to be a good scientist. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So in this slide, a little bit of a template, let's say. You can always refer back to this if you're like, OK, I have my, my, my topic. How can I st um, start uh, my search strategies? This is a good way to do it. So first, you think about um, appropriate databases and other sources that you want to search. Then you uh, start to identify the search terms of your topics, the concepts and other forms, synonyms and related terms. Um, then you build your search string specifically for the first database that you're going to search for. And we're going to talk about all these different aspects of building a search string. And then you take that first um, search strategy and you adapt it to other databases. That's the main idea. Now, we'll talk about more about databases a bit at the end, but um, in this session, I won't really explain the different databases to you, and we'll keep it really um, at the level of the principle of how to build a search strategy. So we'll dive right in with identifying your search terms. So identifying your search terms starts with analyzing your research topic. Might seem like a no-brainer, might seem like something very easy to do, but um, sometimes it's, it's, it's more challenging than you might think at first. Eh? The first question, what is your topic, might seem really easy. Not, not always the case. Uh, I've had a look at your thesis topics for this year, and one I found really cool, really interesting, and the topic was airplane maintenance. Good topic. Uh, my first thought as an, as an information specialist is, okay, airplane maintenance seems interesting, but what do you want to know about airplane maintenance? What exactly is it about airplane maintenance that you're writing your, your thesis about? What, what aspects are highlighted? In what direction do you want to do it? Um, and that's not always very specified at the start. Um, so one of the very, very important things uh, about those kinds of topics is like highlighted here is make sure you are on the same wavelength as your supervisor. Um, so what exactly do they want you to do? And how can you speci specify your topic a bit more to get a better idea of what exactly you have to search for? That's the idea. Uh, another interesting topic uh, that I came across uh, was how sustainable are uh, cryptocurrencies? A bit more clear, a bit more specified than the first one maybe, but what, for example, what do you mean with sustainable? Is it sustainable through time? Is it sustainably like in an ecological sense? Um, one good discussion with your supervisor will make this clear, but of course, those are the kind of things that you have to think about when you get your research topic. Um, in that sense, it's also very important to get some background reading in about your topic at the start. Eh? Gain an overview of the research topic, try to find as much information uh, about the state of the literature at this point in the, in the science. Um, this is also useful to identify potential search terms and keywords. We'll talk a bit more about those later. Um, and of course, don't only need to look for uh, articles, but also check textbooks, uh, dissertations, something like that. A very interesting thing also is to look up definitions. Might seem uh, straightforward, but sometimes um, a definition is very clear in your very specific field, and 
is a bit more vague in, in the broader sense, or uh, not all exact fields use the words in the same way, use uh, concepts in the same way. So it's very interesting and very useful at the start to gain an overview of those uh, problems also. Like, I mean this with these words, but do all the other sciences in my fields also use it like that? And what other ways can other uh, fields use this, these terms as? Things like that are very interesting to think about at the start, before you really dive into your search strategy. Um, we're going to use the building block model. It's pretty straightforward, uh, speaks for itself. Um, and the idea, if you have a question or a topic, um, is to break it up into concepts. And what do we mean by that? Like, for example, if you have a question that is like, what is the effect of concept one on concept two of concept three? So it's, it might also be useful if you have a topic that's not phrased as a question, to phrase it as a question for yourself, eh, if you're wondering how to um, really determine what the concepts are. But that's the basic idea. So it's, it's language skills, basically. To you take the, your research question, you try to find out what are the elements of this research question that I have to combine to find the literature that I need to find to um, do my research. So you have your first concept, and that concept will be um, divided into different synonyms and other terms. We'll talk a bit more about those. And then you have the second concept, same thing. Might have a third concept, same thing. Um, a lot of our examples are with three concepts, but of course, uh, it might seem logical. You might have some, uh, uh, a topic with only two concepts, might have a topic with four concepts. doesn't really matter. Just uh, make it so that it fits your specific research question. So we're going to talk a bit more about those now, uh, how to split your research topic into concepts. We have a bit of a nonsensical example to illustrate this, uh, the use of genetically modified bumblebees to take satellite photographs for Earth visualization. And I am going to ask you to participate in this lesson, always a fun part of this course. Um, so who can think about what the concepts might be in this research question and who can help me out and uh, propose a possible concept in this topic. Um, you can shout it out, you can raise your hands, um, but please participate. So the use of genetically modified bumblebees to take satellite photographs of Earth visualization. For Earth visualization. Yeah? Right, so you've given me four concepts, right? Four concepts, okay. Um, I think two of your concepts might be combined into one, maybe. Uh, but those are very good. Like genetically modified bumblebees, you can talk about genetic modification as a concept on its own, but in this specific research, you're only interested in the bumblebees. So it might not be useful to split it, might be useful to split it. Uh, kind of depends on the situation, actually, so it's, it's quite an interesting thing to have split them up. Uh, in our example, we used three. We have the genetically modified bumblebees, we have the satellite photographs, and we have the Earth visualization. Um, but to be totally honest with you, it's not necessarily wrong to split them up into four. It kind of depends on specifically what your research topic is, I guess. Um, and since this is a nonsensical example, um, it's kind of arbitrary if you take it into four or three. But thank you very much for your response. Second example, uh, exploring mice as model organisms for cultivating corn on Mars. Have any ideas? Who can help me out here? There will be more interactive parts later, so it might be interesting. Yes, tell me. Yeah? Very good. That's entirely correct. So mice, cone cultivation, and Mars. Uh, some people might have thought about the model organisms in this question. That might be an interesting um, think piece, so train of thought. Um, but in this case, mice is an example of a model organism. Um, so. Mice is a more specific, more correct way to phrase it in this case. And model organisms can be left out of this question entirely uh, because mice is an example of a model organism, let's say. 
So thank you for your participation. Um, when you have your concepts, uh, the main ideas of your research topic, it's very uh, necessary to then think about other forms, synonyms, and related terms that you can use to say the same thing, as a, in a way. Um, so the concepts, you can see them as, as keywords. And um, do they cover everything? Usually not. Uh, for example, you have myocardial infarction, which is the same as heart attack, which is the same as cardiovascular stroke. And um, as you guys definitely know, if you put heart attack in a search engine, they won't necessarily also give you results that state myocardial infarctions. And not all databases, not all search engines are um, advanced enough, let's say, to, to make those dis distinctions themself, themselves. So it's very necessary as a researcher that you yourself think about the different ways to state a phrase um, so that you include all the possible literature. Another good example of this is, for example, nylon, which is actually a, a product name. So it's polyamide, PA. Um, chemical structure might also apply depending on your research topic. So there are a lot of different ways sometimes to state the same thing. Those are all necessary to be included. Um, if you think about satellite photograph, um, other forms might, for example, be photograph, photographs, uh, plural. Uh, databases sometimes do account for these, but not all of them. So it's very important to learn how to uh, take plurals into account. For example, photo, photos, photographic, photography, things like that. Uh, with synonyms, we can think of uh, image, picture, snapshot for photograph. Um, and related terms um, are words that are often found in connection with the first keyword. Eh? They can be useful to include, not always, it really depends on your research topic, but it, they're very good to think about uh, when you're building your search strategy. Things like um, graphic, planetary vis visualization, planetary mapping, er earth pictorial, and things like that. Um, and then a last thing to think about is the ladder of generalization. That's um, uh, quite an interesting concept uh, because you, have, you can have a continuum uh, going from very specific terms to very general terms. Uh, for example, like we said before, a model organism is a, um, is a broader category than mice, and then you can go even more specifically into what ki type of mice you want, for example. And a model organism is an, is an animal and, um, or an organism, or a living thing. And like this, you can have the ladder of generalization. might be very, very useful later on, especially if you have, for example, too, too few results or uh, too many results to think about, uh, am I being specific enough or too specific, things like that. So very interesting to think about at the start and uh, keep those terms somewhere. Um, and then the last thing to really think about is the differences in terminology, depending on, for example, British English um, versus American English, but there are other um, uh, types of example of this, for example, primary school, elementary school, same thing, uh, written differently. Corn flour, corn starch, chemist drugstore, uh, but it's the same as with uh, polyamide and nylon, kind of. Uh, you know what I mean. So, very important, you have your concepts and you try to think about forms, synonyms and related terms. Where, where can you find them? Um, very interesting to look at papers, um, at the dictionary, Cesare, Google, ask your colleagues. Um, the work that you've done at the start of like researching your topic and get an overview of the literature, very useful for this stage as well. And just an interesting thing that you might not realize that is also not in the slides, so interesting to remember. Um, most databases only search in title and abstract of an article, for example. Not all, some do search the full text, but most don't. So interesting thing, thing, thing to think about when you're um, selecting a database. And also think of how are the other authors talking about this, cost, this topic? Huh? And what words are they using more specifically in title and abstract? Because if you are having something in mind that usually only described in the methods, you won't find it uh, using a database like Web of Science, for example. If you include that as a topic, you simply won't find any results. So those are the considerations that you need to have uh, while making a literature search. So here we have the building block model again with the different concepts like mice cultivating corn and Mars. Uh, a few examples of possible forms, related terms and synonyms that you might use, like you have 
mice as a first. You have mouse, which is the the singular mus musculus is the Latin name uh, for mice, eh? and the Latin name is usually uh, the biological Latin name uh, in two parts. You have the genus name, mus, which all different types of mouse have the name mus, and then the musculus is the, s the species uh, determinator, so that's just for those who missed biology course uh, a few years ago. That's basically how they work. Uh, so you can also include moose as a genus name if you're interested in mice uh, more generally and not only the species of house mouse. You can add laboratory mouse, you can add Swiss mouse, and so, f and so on and so on. Um, cultivating corn, you can see it as two parts in a way. Uh, you have the cultivating part, so you can talk about cultivation, planting, farming, horticulture, and all the different forms of those words, of course. Uh, and corn, you can also say zia, maize, that's also the Latin name, you can call, talk about maize, you can talk about teosinte, uh, which is the original uh, maize species, the wild um, corn, let's say. Uh, of course, Mars, you can have Mars, red planet, and so on. Um, so that's a bit of the example. In this case, as you can see, a few of them are barred out. And I'll explain a little bit more about that later. Um, so we're going to use an example in this course to um, give you a bit more of a practical approach to this question. We'll use this example throughout the whole process. So. Uh, Hopefully, by the end, you exactly know how to build a search strategy using this example. Um, so the use of biocomposites for biomedical implants. Um, we are going to look for the concepts here. Any ideas what types of concepts you can... What are the concepts in this research question? The use of biocomposites for biomedical implants. Any idea? Very good, indeed. Only two concepts in this case, but they suffice for this research topic. So biocomposites and biomedical implants. Um, and I'm now going to give you a little bit of an exercise. Um, the idea is that you yourselves, um, with the help of your colleagues, with your help of your smartphone, your computer, whatever, try to find other synonyms, forms, and related terms for biocomposites and biomedical implants. I'm going to give you five minutes, so until um, the quarter past one. Um, yeah, so open your laptops, take your smartphone, talk to your colleagues, and try to find some related terms, um, synonyms, and forms for these to add as extra keywords for your search strategy. All right. So the five minutes are up. Who, can, who has found some um, synonyms, forms, related terms for biocomposites? You can shout them out if you want, or you can raise your hand as you prefer. Biocompounds. Okay, something else? Resin based composites. Okay. Yeah. Biofibers. Anyone else? Those can't be the only three you've thought about. Yeah? Organic compounds. Okay. Any anything else? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Uh, natural fiber reinforced composites is what you said. Huh? Okay. Any other ideas? Biopolymers. It's interesting. 
Yeah, others? Are there other words, other ways to say biocomposites? You know of any? I've, for example, found green composites, not entirely the same, but similar enough that it might be, but that it might be interesting in this case. Something else? Like if you think of biocomposites, might also be bio-based composites. Again, might be an interesting idea. All right. And we can continue for a while, um, I think, in the case of biocomposites. Biomedical implants, does anyone have any good ideas for biomedical implants? Yeah? Biological implants? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Anything else? In a medical world, world, if you think of an implant, another type of word can be used for a similar um, idea of like adding something to the human body. Prosthetics, yeah, good one. Prosthetics or prosthesis may also be uh, interesting because those are differently diff different enough that the database won't necessarily find them. And I think, to be honest, um, I don't know, anybody has any other ideas for uh, biomedical implants? No, I think in this case, it might be sufficient as well. So thanks for your cooperation, and we'll use these later um, when we actually build our search strategy for a specific database. Um, so these are a few that we found beforehand, just as an um, as added uh, inspiration, let's say. But uh, yours are very good as well. All right. So we've uh, gone into how to split your topic into different concepts, and then how to add other terms to these concepts uh, to make your more your search strategy more. Um, complete, let's say. Um, and then in the next step, we're going to build a specific search string. And the difference here, the, the search string is very specific to a database and also uses the specific uh, syntax, let's say, that the database requires. That is the idea of the search string. So as stated, we'll build a search string. We'll talk a bit more, more about phrases, truncation wildcards, Boolean operators, proximity operators, nesting, and then some troubleshooting and extra information that you'll get from me. Um, first things first, phrases. So the idea is that um, two or more words can be a search term, eh? like bio compounds. Uh, of, or biocomposites before. Um, you can write them as bio and composites or bio-based composites. Uh, and your database will necessarily know that you want to keep them together if you don't specify it. So the idea behind phrases is that you specify that some words need to be stuck together and considered as one uh, keyword. Um, the basic idea is that you use quotation marks, single or double, depending on the database, to specify that your um, keywords are uh, uh, actually a phrase. Some search automatically for phrases, but others don't, so it's uh, just a good idea that you keep those rules in mind and that you apply them. Eh? So remember, two or more words, quotation marks, makes it a phrase. Second thing, uh, truncation and wildcards. So the idea behind truncation is that you can abbreviate a search term to um, to, s to search for multiple things at once. That's the idea behind it. So um, the asterisk, asterisk is the most used wildcard, and uh, usually it represents any group of characters. So it can be um, zero to uh, infinite number of characters, well, infinite in theory. Yeah? Uh, most databases don't go into infinite characters, but you know what I mean. Um, so to illustrate, the right-hand truncation is the most 
commonly used uh, and usually possible in, in most databases. Like, for example, if you look for compo with an asterisk, you will get composite, composites, components, composition, but also composer, compost. Um, so you get the idea. This is also a good example of why you can't why you should think about where to truncate, because in this case, for example, uh, the composite composites components might all be interesting, but composer and compost will probably not be interesting. So choosing where to put your uh, truncation is pretty important to not get too many noise in your results, let's say. Uh, another practical example might be with the nylon before. PA asterisk can give you PA6, PA6.6, PA510, and so on and so forth. Um, Left-hand truncation, also possible in some databases, but not in all databases. So again, you need to check for your database. Uh, it can be used to broaden a search as well. So for example, if you search for asterisk work, you can look for work, framework, network, artwork, rework, fieldwork. So interesting tool to simplify your search strategy in a way and to look for multiple things at once, uh, truncation wildcards. Other um, wildcards um, can be used to overcome, for example, differences in spelling. Um, these also are database dependent, like all these things, so keep that in mind. For example, the question mark in Web of Science can represent a single character, but it has to be one character. So, for example, you can look for lychee with a question mark uh, to include the two spelling differences. Uh, the fence is the same thing. Uh, and the dollar sign can represent zero or one character. Eh? So, for example, in color, you can look for the color with, with or without a U, uh, leveling with or without a second L. That's the idea behind it. So these, again, database dependent can be very interesting for words that have different spellings in different types of English, let's say. Um, okay, so that was it for the truncation, the wildcards. Now about Boolean operators. They actually tell your database what to do with different keywords that you give them. They're pretty much the same as in logic and computer science. Eh? There's and, or, and not. Um, the and, you, you, specify, you specify to your database that you're looking for mice and Mars, so they will only give you results that have both the, world, the words mice and Mars in the title or abstract, for example. Um, these are mostly used to combine your different concepts. Eh? If you think about a build building block model, um, to specify that you want your concept one and your concept two, you use and. Second one, or, uh, is very useful to combine the forms, the synonyms, and the related terms, eh? because you tell your database, I want to find mice or rats, so you find everything that has Mice, rat, and mice or rat. Speaks for itself. Um, you, then you have not, also uh, present in most databases, um, that's useful to exclude the term. For example, uh, this is a bit of a nonsensical example. Uh, mice and not Coca-Cola Zero, but you never know that you're in the field of mice study and uh, they have studied the effect of Coca-Cola Zero a lot already and you're interested in other diet um, soft drinks. I don't know, then you can... Ex you could think of excluding it that way. It's a bit of a dangerous one, not. Because, of course, in this case, you also exclude the ones that have mice and Coca-Cola. And, um, for example, you might be interesting, interested in a um, study about mice that has been sponsored by Coca-Cola Zero, for example. Or that has been uh, the Coca-Cola Zero anywhere else in an image or any... Uh, yeah, no, an image is probably not a good idea, but that has Coca-Cola Zero specified anywhere else, and that article might still be relevant to you. Um, so not as a dangerous one, especially if you want to exclude um, things that are kind of similar and you're sure you're not interested in one, but you might definitely be interested in the other. You might miss really, really interesting things that have looked at both, for example, um, that might still apply. So if you ever think of using not, you can always al also contact us because there are some uh, crafty ways to, to use it and still account for the uh, combined um, results but just a cautionary tale with using a knot. Um, then the proximity operators. Those are really, really database dependent. So of course, always check how they're phrased, how to use them, um, and, and what the different options are here. But uh, just to illustrate what might be possible, um, there are near or next. Uh, slash n, and n minus 1 is the maximum number of words between the two search terms. So the idea behind uh, proximity operators is that you um, 
that you can specify like a phrase, but with option of having words in between the two words. Eh? For example, in the next, um, you can look for autonomous next three to vehicle, and then they will search for autonomous vehicle, autonomous guided vehicle, autonomous car or vehicle. You get the idea. So it gives you the option of phrasing with the possibilities of having words in between um, if sometimes the authors have written it that way in the abstract, for example. might be very interesting. Um, there's a bit of a difference between next and near, because in next, the specific order of the search terms has been defined. So autonomous has to come before vehicle. That's how you specified it. In a near type function, uh, the, or the order of the search term is not important. Uh, so in this case, if you take the same example, it will give the same results as the previous one, but also, for example, for vehicles that drive autonomously might also be um, found in this one. We say it's a database dependent thing because, for example, Web of Science, which is a, a very good database, very useful to use, uh, only has um, like an equivalent to the near function, but not to the next function, for example. And in a Web of Science, you can't specify the order um, of the search terms. And then you have other databases like Scopes, for example, that has that has that makes the distinction. They're called differently than next and near, but that's that's basically the idea behind these proximity operators. Um, next, maybe one of the most important ones to remember is nesting, because um, a good database, basically like mathematics rules, has uh, the order of precedence of the different operators. So in Web of Science, for example, they will first take into account the near, then the not, then the and, and then the or. Um, so in the example found, above, uh, found below, mice or rat near 10 Mars does not give you the same results as mice or rat between brackets near 10 Mars, because they will find rat near 10 Mars or mice, and that's not what you want. So with nesting, pretty simple, use basic mat uh, mathematics rules, use brackets. Uh, parentheses are your best friends in building search strategies, so if you want to specify which words go together and in what order to take them into account, put parentheses on, uh, in your search strategy. Might be the most useful tool in this um, course. All right, so those are a bit of the helps that you can use, the, the tools, the guidelines for how to build a, a search strategy for a database. Um, and now we'll go into the more practical part. Uh, as before, this example of exploring mice's model organisms for cultivating corn on Mars. Uh, we've, um, in the building block model, I've shown you a bit uh, earlier in the um, course, we had a few different uh, keywords for the first concept, uh, more mouse, Mice, moose, moose, musculus, laboratory mouse, or Swiss mouse. Um, as you can see, these are all combined with or. And the phrases, like the, the, the keywords that are two words, have parentheses between them. Now, a few of them uh, can be actually removed from this. Why? Because if you search for moose, your database will, of course, also give you all, all the results that have moose musculus in them. And if you search for mouse, you will, of course, find all of them that mention laboratory mouse or Swiss mouse. So in this case, these can be removed, because if you search for mouse, all the results with Swiss mouse will, of course, also be included, because you've already searched for mouse. Um, second concept. As we said before, can be seen as two parts in one, eh, the maze part and the cultivating part. So in this case, we do something a bit crafty. We take all the uh, forms and synonyms for maze, we put them into brackets, and we specify that we want to find those and the cultivation, planting, farming, horticulture, things like that. You can do this. Might be a good, um, depending on your topic, might be a good solution uh, for your subjects, uh, and then Mars or Red Planet, and again Red Planet in between parentheses. Yeah, and then, of course, if you want to have this as a full search string, you take your first concept in between brackets, you put an and, second concept in between brackets, and third concept in between brackets, because you're interested, of course, in results that mention all three of them. That's the idea. So we'll go uh, a bit more into example later, but just um, 
to give you a few general guidelines when uh, starting this type of work and when building your search strategy. Um, first tip might be silly, actually very useful, very important, keep a search log. So open Notepad, Word, whatever type of uh, text-based document that you like to use, you might even do it in Excel, I don't care. Um, but try to keep a log of your search string. Um, Building a search strategy is an iterative process. That's how it works the best. Uh, you, you try a few things, you think of a few concepts, and then you read some literature. And you ah, oh, this is a very good keyword. I haven't thought of that one before. You add it to your search strategy, and so on and so forth, until you're kind of happy with the results, or until you're, co you're quite sure that it's complete, or until you don't have time anymore, of course. Um, but that's the basic idea. And also, to not lose, uh, so to not lose any of your work, keep uh, your work dated in a document, so you can also s look at your own thought process, you remember everything you did, basically good idea to keep a search log. Um, second tip, save your searches. Most databases allow you to uh, make an account um, to so you can log in and you can actually save the searches that you've made, um, so might also be a good idea. You can also add a notification so if you're happy with your search strategy, especially useful uh, if you go on to have a, a, a doctorate or if you continue in the research world, uh, but might also be useful now, of course, um, is to have an alert saved. So if you're really happy with your search strategy concerning your research topic, um, you can have an alert and all new publications that are added to the database that might be applicable for you will get a notification from it. Uh, so it saves you from having to look at the database over and over and over again. And if you want to keep up to date with the literature, it's a good idea. Um, so as I said before, it's an iterative process, so you can continue to add the synonyms, the related uh, terms, uh, onto your first draft of your search strategy, it's a good idea. Um, select uh, relevant databases for your work, of course. Uh, if you get zero results, might be because of very few results, might be because you've made a mistake, but might also be because the database is not very really relevant, but I don't think that might be too big of a problem for you guys. And uh, a last tip that I don't have a lot of time to go into, but it might be really interesting to remember, is the snowballing idea. So what's snowballing? Because uh, you can search for literature, like we said, go in a database, type a search query, and just look at the results that way. But you can also, for example, um, if you're lucky and you have a very nice uh, supervisor for your master's thesis, he or her, uh, he or she gave you, like, three, four papers to get you started on your study. So it might be really, really interesting to go into the reference list of these papers and see, oh, what, what work did they reference? Is there anything interesting in these references that I might use in my research? Yes, of course. That's the idea behind backward snowballing. So you can do backward snowballing by going through a reference list, and then you can also forward snowballing. And for that, you can use um, databases that are citation databases. I'll talk a bit more about those later, but uh, Web of Science is a citation database, for example. And what's possible in Web of Science is that you go um, and you can see, actually, all of the other papers that are citing this paper as a reference. So you know, backward snowballing, you go check the references. Forward snowballing, you go check the citations. Um, so those are uh, more recent works that actually refer to the paper that you're interested in. Might also have very relevant results for your topic in there. Might also be a very good way to kickstart your thinking process of how am I going to find other keywords, things like that. So general guidelines and extra tips that might uh, be useful for you guys while building your search strategy. A few extra tips again. What to do when you get too many results. Um, think about creating more search phrases. Uh, bigger search phrases might be a good one. Uh, don't be more general than you need to be. I, I've talked uh, At the start, I've talked about the ladder of generalization. So think of, uh, am I using too general uh, concepts? To, should I specify them a bit more? It might be a good idea. Um, you can uh, filter your database to limit by date, document type, study type. Can be useful. Uh, remove terms that are too general, uh, if you can, uh, and can always think about adding an extra concept using AND when applicable. And as I said, you can use not to eliminate a certain aspect you're not interested in, but a cautionary tale, as I've said before, so if you think about doing that, you can always uh, contact us as well for extra help. Now, what to do when you don't have enough results? 
Um, wonder if your database is relevant for your topic. Um, but f for first and foremost, check for spelling mistakes or other errors in your search query. Uh, happens more often than you think. Uh, simply forgot a space or put a bracket in the wrong place or something. Uh, usually is what happens if you only get like six results. Uh, not a good idea. So that. Um, add other synonyms and related terms might also be a very big one. Eh? If you, you haven't really thought about your concept yet in a, in a broad sense, might have missed very, very important keywords that the whole part of the world uses for your research topic. So think more about those. Wonder if your Boolean operators are used uh, correctly, use uh, truncation or wildcards to find more variations that you might not have thought of at the start. Uh, and again, you can snowball backwards and forwards in time, as I said before. So those are the main consideration about um, your search string itself. I'll talk a bit, uh, a tiny bit about databases, and then we'll go into the second part of the practical exercise on how to take the search terms that we've um, collected before and how to make them into an actual uh, search string for Web of Science. So, databases uh, and other search engines, let's say, because not all of those are technically databases, but let's not go too much into detail about the technicality of databases. That's not the point of this course. Um, you can use Google. Very user-friendly, very fast. Um, of course, the information is not 100% uh, trustworthy. We all know this. I don't believe everything you read on the internet. Um, but m maybe even more importantly, something that not everybody realizes is that the ranking of the results is not objective. Um, they can have commercial purposes, statistics, uh, own interests, nation nationalistic reasons, and so on and so forth. So if you... Um, are wondering about the reproducibility of your work and the um, independence of your own study, using Google has its caveats as your main database. Uh, kind of the same thing with Google Scholar, actually. Uh, you don't have any... Uh, the, the ranking of the results is also not always objective, and you don't really get a good view into it. So, uh, cautionary tale here as well. Um, and Google Scholar can be really, really useful, um, but you can't also can't find everything via Google Scholar. Um, so using specialized uh, scientific databases really has its uh, advantages, let's say. A few examples of uh, databases and a few distinctions of databases. Uh, I've mentioned this before already. You have the basic bibliographic database. Uh, that's what most of you think of, I think, when you think of a database. It's something like Web of Science, like PubMed, like Scopus, like Embase. Um, it, it gives you basically the bibliographic information of a work. Things like the author, the abstract, the keywords, the references. Um, usually the database itself doesn't have the full text of the article. Uh, also, something that you might have wondered already, if you've ever searched something like uh, Web of Science that you can get access to through KU Leuven, you can notice that not all papers are accessible on Web of Science. Why? Because the access to the paper itself is actually paid for by the library. That's a subscription to the journal that the library has. It it's basically still works the same as before uh, the internet, as in that uh, we still have uh, a subscription to a journal that's released every month or every um, now and well, at the, the rate that it's released. And then the database is a tool to search the literature, but those aren't necessarily linked. Uh, we also pay for that tool, but it's not because it's included in the database that we also have a subscription to the specific journal. So just something to know. Um, and that's also why you should um, think of how do authors write about this in title abstract. I said this before, but most databases don't include the full text in their databases. They just include the title and the abstract and the other information, but the full text is not in the database itself, per se, but just a link to it. Um, then you have the citation databases. Also explained a little bit more about those. Uh, Scopus and Web of Science are a good example. They have the bibliographic information, and they also make a, a, a link between these publications forward in time, as I said with uh, the forward snowballing. So you can check who cited whom. It might be a very interesting tool as well. And then you can wonder, oh, where does Limo fit into all this? Limo is more of a type of catalog. 
So Limo indexes everything that the KU Leuven has a subscription to, that the KU Leuven has access to. But it's, uh, it doesn't cite every interesting work on your subject necessarily. So that's an, also an interesting distinction to make between th something like Limo and something like Web of Science. Um, Web of Science, better to find a broader variety of publication on your work, and then Limo, better to find work that is actually available at KU Leuven. You might wonder, why should I look for works that aren't available at KU Leuven? I can't have access to them anyway. Well, you might miss a very, very useful and interesting piece of literature that you can't necessarily access through KU Leuven, but maybe you have a colleague that has um, access to it, somebody you know from another university might have access to it, or it might be so interesting that you might consider you or your supervisor to pay for it and to have access of it that way. So, consideration to think about. Um, yeah, I won't really talk more about Limo, uh, but if you're ever wondering, because we've talked about databases so much, you can find the databases that are uh, available in KU Leuven in Limo. So if you go to Limo, uh, I don't know if you've ever looked uh, there, but it has a database tab. Click on it, it has all the uh, available databases, sometimes paid for for KU Leuven, sometimes free of access databases are also included in Limo. And um, yeah, usually ranked by subject, kind of. Um, so it might be a good place also to get some inspiration if you have, um, if you wonder if you have a more specific database for your subject, let's say. So good uh, thing to look at. And then uh, a tiny word about indexed versus non-indexed databases. I don't know if you've ever heard about the distinction between indexed and non-indexed databases, um, so just to give you the information anyway. So the idea of an indexed database is that it has a sort of controlled vocabulary that, can, uh, that are used to describe the subject of an article. Uh, you can think of it as a, a sort of hashtag or a sort of tag that's been decided by the database owners and it's linked to, uh, to all articles with the same subject. That's the idea behind it. Um, a lot of uh, more specific databases have a good, um, are indexed and have a good index, uh, but uh, more general, more multidisciplinary databases are more difficult to index, uh, so don't necessarily use an index. Uh, Web of Science, for example, doesn't have one. And we include this because the way you search an index database is a little bit different than the way you should search a non-index database. Uh, for example, PubMed, uh, one, of the yeah, one of the biggest um, databases in the biomedical literature, very good one, they use the MESH terms, the medical subject headings, um, to index their database. Uh, for example, in our, um, they have a MESH term for prosthesis and implants. So in the example that we used before, um, all the articles that talk about prosthesis and implants, will have the mesh term prosthesis and implants added to it. Um, they are uh, ranked, so it's a bit of a tree structure, so you have more specific um, mesh terms and more general mesh terms, and the letter of generalization can also be useful for that. And so if you find an article in uh, PubMed that is talking about uh, these subjects, you can see in the uh, mesh term list that prosthesis and implants uh, is also here. Why do we say this? Uh, in the non-index databases, you basically work the way that we've taught you before. Um, and in an index database, it's actually more useful to start your concept with the index term. So to first go look into the, the, the um, vocabulary of the database and start there. Um, and then to add all the other synonyms and keywords afterwards as well. Uh, why sometimes you get the question, why if, if the indexes work really well, why should I make the effort of adding all the other uh, synonyms and related terms as well? Because all articles should be included, right? Yes and no. Uh, it's still very useful if you want to be complete. Why? Because the most recent literature doesn't have a mesh term yet, for example, in PubMed, because they, have, they are indexed 
by hand, so real humans read the paper and choose which index terms to add to it. Um, so the most recent literature isn't included. And then secondly, um, the similarity rate is about 50%, which is actually quite good because uh, if you let uh, uh, artificial intelligence and things like that determine the mesh terms, the uh, inconsistencies get usually bigger. But still, um, yeah, especially for m yeah, in some cases, the, the, the exact mesh terms, but it's, it's uh, how can I say it? Of course, it's, it's kind of subjective which mesh term you choose to add to the article. So still very necessary to add all the other things, but a uh, better way to st still start with the index term because it's really, really useful uh, as a starting point. So a few closing remarks on databases. Like I said before, create an account. Um, uh, usually pretty self-explanatory in all the databases. And the second one might be the biggest tip as well I'm going to give you when you want to use a database is to check the help function. Like I said, the syntax in all databases is usually different. Um, it's not all databases have the same function and they, they don't use it in the same way. So just open the help function, look it up and build it that way. That's actually the easiest way to get started in a new database that you don't know already uh, and to then adapt to other databases as well. So the help function is, as usual, your best friend. Um, and then turn on alerts, but I've said that also to get notified of the uh, most recent literature. Uh, a few database examples just to get you started, uh, to give you some inspiration. Um, might be applicable for you guys, so uh, when you're thinking about liter literature, just open the slide up again. Um, and now to the fun closing parts of my part of this course. Um, we've had a few, uh, a few concepts before and we've added some other synonyms and terms, and now we're going to try to uh, make them into a more complete um, search string. So, basic idea, as I said, you take any type of um, text processing or other uh, type of document that you like and you log what you're doing. Eh? So in my case, I've used Word because we get Microsoft Office at KU Leuven as uh, employees. Um, and then you take the list of concepts that you guys have given me before. So I'm going to quickly paste them into here. All right. So, who remembers how I should uh, link the different concepts together? No, how, sh how I should link the different keywords together within a concept? Can, I, can anyone tell me? How can I? Yeah. With or, of course. So, if we take biocomposites as a first one. Let's continue this way. Um, what things should I be mindful of when I look and um, when I search for biocomposites in this way? Any idea? Yeah. Yeah, good one. So the use of wildcards, huh? truncation with the asterisk, very good one to. Um, to actually get the plural included as well. Any other things that I should be mindful of? Yeah? Quotation marks, Quotation marks. why? You remember? Yeah, to group the term indeed. So phrasing uh, indeed with quotation marks. Um, so basically, biocompounds, same thing. And you can do this for all of the different uh, concepts in this case. Um, any other ideas of what I could do with this l word list? Uh, 
So if you want to keep it simple, eh, you do the same thing with all of these, put an asterisk at the end to include the, the, the plural and uh, take the phrases, the, the two word concepts into uh, f um, quotation marks and you might have a good start already. Eh? Other things that you can think about if you want is, for example, uh, truncate more than this just to get um, more results. Uh, for example, you could think, uh, I have compound and composite. The start of the word is the same, so I might truncate with the O. But as shown before, then you might also get uh, useless results. So something you can try uh, and you can also uh, leave as it is. Um, another interesting thing that you might do is you see that we have a lot of uh, different um, how, is, how to say, words combined with composites. So you might, for example, in this case, um, split them and combine them into brackets with and. So in, I can, for example, say bio between, well, I'll show you down here, it might be easier. I could go brackets, bio, or green, or bio-based. In this case, I don't even need bio-based because bio is included. Um, or organic, let's say, or well, natural fiber. <laughs> In, in your example, and then combine with and and go composite. And if we, since we've um, added compound as a good, um, we can go for example and composite or compound. You see what I mean with this? Um, so it might be also a very good way to simplify your search and to make it more inclusive because then afterwards you can think of like, ah, uh, what other uh, adjectives can I use instead of bio, green, natural fibers. Um, and then you can also here go. And to be honest, what I would do personally, I would remove, remove fiber here and just for natural here and then go composite or compound or polymer or fiber, or fiber, because I found it written this way as well in the literature, not often, but some people do. I don't know why, but it happens. Um, this might give you too many results. Huh? If, if you find that the polymer combined with natural is still too broad uh, and not specific enough, might be something to tweak of, but I think I've included all of these um, terms with just this search right here. So this is a way that you can then take all the synonyms, the concepts, and really think of, okay, how am I going to tweak this to make it the easiest for myself to work and rework it in a database. The advantage of this way, for me personally, for example, but it's also a bit of a, of a, yeah, a, a learned skill, let's say. It's something that you have to feel good about, so find the way that you like to work best. But I like to work this way, for example, because if I find other uh, synonyms for composites or if I find other synonyms for the bio part, I can just uh, add to here. So I could go, for example, here as well and add organic, for example, like this, because organic fiber was one, I think, that was mentioned before. Um, so this is... Of course, not complete enough yet, but a good start. Eh? Um, and then the second part, any um, ideas what I could do with this? Ah, oh, thanks. Here we go. Um, so we have biomedical implants, biological implants, prosthetics, prosthesis. Any propositions on what to do? Yeah? 
Yeah. So like this, right? Yeah. Good. Um, and what to do with the implant parts? What would you guys do? Any idea? Yeah? You can definitely do that. Which would actually be a very good idea. What I personally would do, because um, in my opinion, implants in these contexts will usually be biomedical or biological. You can just remove the first terms. You can just look for implants. In this case, implants or prosthetics. Um, or prosthesis eh, with the with the wild card, and of course, then if you notice in your results, like ah, implants is used in a way that I didn't expect, and I get a lot of irrelevant um, literature because the the word implant is is being used in a different context of not the biomedical context. Then you can add these back again and um, think about how to phrase the biomedical or biological in different ways. Um, any idea what to do with implants? Anyone? Do I look for it this way or do I do something else with it? Yeah. I'm lucky you're here, eh? otherwise it would be very silent. Uh, thank you for the right answer, of course. Implants or uh, prostheme, like this. So, a few considerations. We're going to try this in Web of Science. As I said, it's not complete, but it might be a good start. Uh, you need to have the uh, access of Web of Science via KU Leuven. So, there are a few ways to get to Web of Science via KU Leuven. Don't just Google it, uh, then you won't be logged in properly. You can go via Limo, uh, the way I showed in the presentation, or you go to the uh, bib.kuleuven.be website, and we have a tab, databases. Yeah, I put it in Dutch, but you can also find them in English. This can also be a good page to find some inspiration for possible databases that you can use. And if you here click on Web of Science, then you know you are uh, at Web of Science through the correct portal, usually, if everything went correctly. Now, the advanced search, luckily Web of Science has, uh, has been renewed like last year or the year before, and it's much, much more comprehensive than it was previously, so Web of Science is a good idea. And uh, one of the things that you have to specify in Web of Science, for example, is a field tag. So you give search terms to your database, but you have to tell them in what fields that they have to search for these terms. For example, you can specify the author, you can specify the publication, and things like that. Um, for in our case, the most interesting one is topic, because then it searches for a title, abstract, and a few other things. So um, what we do is we put the field tag TS uh, and the um, ha, I've lost the word in English, the is gelijk aan, the equality sign. Um, and then everything between parentheses again. And you do the same thing with your second concept. Um, and then the second tip that I'm going to give you uh, now is it's easier to input the concepts separately in your database because it makes it easier to, uh, change, to make changes to your uh, search while you're busy with it. So um, you just paste it in the query option and you click on not what I wanted to click on, uh, but it also works. Uh, I'll show you again. You can, here there's a little arrow and you can click on add to history. Um, of course I searched it, so it will be added to my history here. You do the same with your uh, different, your second concepts, and of course if you, if you have more than two concepts, uh, you do it for all your concepts. Uh, I add to history here. Okay, and now I have my two different concepts in my history, and you can combine them, and I should combine them with, just say it, and very good, uh, combined with and, and I get 3,400, 700, that's a bit too many results. Um, more than almost, what, 35,000 results? Too much. What I think is happening here is that uh, compound, is uh, too broad of a synonym for composite because in material sciences, composite is a yeah, it's a very specific type of material uh, that has a, a, a net structure and then a type of resin or polymer to embed them in. And I 
I suppose that compound in this case will actually be a, a too general type of synonym. Um, that's my hypothesis in this case. So um, too many results, first step, uh, look at your concepts again and try to see um, what you can specify more. But of course, it's just a tryout, and this is a, this is how you have to think about literature searching. This is how you um, make your queries. Because, for example, if imagine I remove compounds, uh, then you can look, you can see what it uh, looks like. I just go back to add to query. Uh, yeah, is this? Is this how I should? Uh, no, because there's still something in my query. I'm very sorry. If I go back to add to query, like this, and I remove compound. See, that's why it's useful to keep your concept separately. Um, edit. Oh, thank you, Anouk. Um, here we go. Save as new set. And then I can combine these two again with and. Still too many results. OK, so might not be the only thing that I've made too general in this case. Um, but this is just an illustration on how you can uh, play with your different concepts. U usually, not a good idea to just willy-nilly, um, like I've just done now, so bad example, uh, just willy-nilly remove and add concepts. Um, I thought of this because in the work that I've done before, I've tested this already, so I, I already have a bit of an inkling what might be the problem. But usually it's a good idea to then look at your results and try to figure out that way if there is noise and, and useless things and what they might be caused by in your search ring. That's the idea. So this was it for my part of the presentation. I thank you all for your attention. And uh, my colleague, Linda, will take over now. Oh, and uh, if you have any questions, of course, because I can still quickly show you the contact slides. Um, don't hesitate to contact us, because um, we also give some um, help. We, we can help students with their search string and things like that. So if you're stumped, uh, you try it out, you get too many results or too little, you do anything you do, or you get your topic and you're like, what are my concepts? I don't understand. Just uh, shoot me an email and uh, I'll try to help. Are there any questions? No, then I'll leave it to my colleague. And thank you all for your attention. Okay, so let's start with the second part about this information literacy session. Uh, we will talk about uh, plagiarism and how you can avoid it. You have how you have to write references, how you uh, compose your bibliography at the end of your texts. I will also talk about reference management systems and more particular um, about EndNote Online. Now, I try to get this video started. At some point in your career as a student, you've probably had a teacher tell you to cite your sources while writing a research paper. But what is a citation, and why do we do it? Citation is the practice of identifying the sources you have quoted, paraphrased, or otherwise used in your writing, and it's pretty standard practice in academic writing. Citations serve several purposes. For one, it allows your reader to follow up on and to verify claims that you make in your writing, and it gives you the opportunity to acknowledge the people whose ideas you have used to advance your argument. Essentially, you are recognizing that your research and scholarship builds upon the work and the ideas of many others who came before you. The result is that citation helps readers see the connections between books and articles published by many different authors, as well as how they connect to your own ideas. There are many different styles of citation established by various academic and professional organizations. The most common styles, however, are MLA, APA, Chicago, and CSE. Most styles involve a two-part process. First, you acknowledge a source with a brief notation after you use it in the body of your paper. Then, you provide more detailed information about the source at the end of your paper in the works cited list or bibliography. This more detailed entry will include essential publication information about the source, including the title of the work, the author, and the date of publication, 
so that your readers can find it. Each citation style has a published guide outlining all the details of how to use it, and there are also many online tools to help. If you have any questions about citation as a practice... Yeah. So now you already have an idea why you have to cite your sources. Because if someone uh, is reading your text, they should be able to trace the original sources that you are citing in, uh, your, that you have used for writing your text. Because your master thesis will always be um, some original part from yourself, new data, new experience, but also you will cite research that has been done before you started with your, your thesis. So to really be able to trace all those original sources, you have to cite them correctly in your text and write an ex exhaustive or an extended complete reference at the end of your text in your bibliography. It's also to pay some respect to all those researchers who have already done quite a lot of work uh, before you. Um, and also to avoid plagiarism, of course. Eh? So what is the definition of plagiarism in general? It is using someone else's work, but also his ideas, and then um, consider them or show them as if they were your own, so without acknowledging uh, their work. It's also part, of course, of scientific fraud. And in KU Leuven, I just uh, give you here the definition of the education e and examination regulations. So this is the complete definition of uh, plagiarism according to KU Leuven. Now let's have a look. What do you already know, know about avoiding plagiarism? So these are some cases, and you have to tell me whether it's plagiarism or not. For my master's thesis, I'm building on the subject of my bachelor's thesis. I don't refer to my bachelor's thesis because my promoter knows I've written it. Is this plagiarism or not? Can you say it aloud because we are recording? <laughs> I see some people nodding. Yes? Yes. It is because you also have to refer to your previous own work. Otherwise, we call it self-plagiarism. So to avoid this, always take care if you also, if you have a new assignment, and a few years ago, you did already uh, um, more or less the same assignment, and you use some parts of your first assignment, don't forget to always cite that first assignment in your second one. When I want to paraphrase some paragraphs from an original text, I adjust a few words in the original text. Is this really paraphrasing or not? Yeah, just shoot. Does it matter if it's not okay? We don't mind. This is not an examination. Is this okay? Paraphrasing is summarizing some parts of your original text in your own words. So it's not only just adjusting a few words from the original text. You really have to summarize it in your own words. When you copy a figure, a code, a computer code or whatever, a table, a structure, other elements from an original source, I state the original source and also the author. Is this okay or is this plagiarism? Don't be afraid. Sorry? Is it okay? Yeah. Of course it's okay uh, if you really state all, not only the author, but you also have to refer to the original source, so then it's okay. Writing a complete bibliography at the end of your work without references in the text, is that plagiarism or no plagiarism? Yes? 
Why? Yeah. It's not only about writing an extensive bibliography at the end of the text, but you also have to, ma to make sure that you cite or refer to the source in your bibliography in the text. So also the references or citations in the text, um, you don't have to forget them because otherwise it's also plagiarism. I want to use a paragraph of an article written in Dutch huh, while I have to write my assignment in English, very common. I translate the paragraph and I use it in my paper. Since it's no literal translation, translation, I don't have to refer to the original article. Is this a correct way of working? Or is this also plagiarism? Yeah, because it's always plagiarism. If you just literal translate it or just paraphrase it in your own words, you always have to refer. Now, if it's a literal translation, don't forget to put that part of the text between quotation marks. It works the same as if you uh, quote literally a part from an original text. You don't paraphrase it, you just copy the original uh, parts from the original text. Literally, then you have to put them between quotation marks, so don't forget it. Now here you have uh, four cases, and in which case do we speak of plagiarism? Um, you cite without quotation marks, you write no references or write them wrongly. Uh, Self-plagiarism, or you write no references for open or open access sources. In which case do we speak of plagiarism? Is it A, B, C, or D, or all of them? Shoot. Yeah. You all agree? In all cases, it's plagiarism. So uh, you can paraphrase parts of an original text, but don't forget to refer to the uh, original source. And also, of course, don't forget to uh, cite your own work in later work, yes? so your own previous work in later assignments. Um, this I already told you, if you copy an original part or, or a part of the original text literally, don't forget to use quotation marks. And you can literally translate, but you can also paraphrase. Uh, and if you literally translate a part of the original text, don't forget your quotation marks. Uh, you can copy figures, tables, images, uh, or whatever, but you always have to refer to the original source and, of course, to the author. There's also an interesting presentation from Professor Bart Nowelaars about uh, intellectual integrity and plagiarism, if you need some more information on the website of your uh, workshops for your master thesis, so you can have a look at it. When are you not obliged to refer? Facts that are common knowledge, uh, like for instance, World War I was from 1914 till 1918. And of course, your own original, if you use it for the first time, your new data, you don't have to uh, use references. In case of doubt, uh, if you, well, you know, okay, this fact, or you think everybody should know this fact, but you're not very sure, uh, it's not, if it's common knowledge or not, maybe the best thing to do is just add a reference so that you're always okay. Now, referencing correctly means that you use uh, references and you cite, you start using uh, references from the first sentences, uh, first sentence based on your source. And in the bibliography at the end of your document, you write all the references that you have used in your text. 
Now, uh, like for instance, here you see the IEEE style. Um, in the first sentence, you will say research between brackets eight because it's a numeric, numerical system. So eight uh, refers to your first, or the, the, the source that you have used. Research eight shows that. So it's already in the first sentence that you are paraphrasing uh, information from an original source. And then um, in the bibliography, uh, the, the references are built up in numerical order of the text. So there you have the complete reference with the title of the article, the author of the article, the title of the journal, and so on. And the digital object identifier, but I will tell you later more about it. Now there are different styles for uh, writing references and bibliographies, and those styles define what elements should be in your reference, in what kind of order, and also with what kind of punctuation. Uh, like for instance here, they, um, in the IEEE style, they write the, uh, the title of the article in italics. This is not for all the different styles the case. Eh? So it's really depending upon which style that you use, how you are writing your references. So a num numerical system works with uh, uh, your numbers in the text and in the bibliography. You also have the author year system, which is used by the Harvard style or the APA style. So then you cite your sources in the text between brackets with the family name of the first author of your article, comma, year of publication. And then the bibliography at the end of your text will be in alphabetical order on the first or the family name of the first author. There's also a footnote system so that the reference will be underneath the page in which you cite that uh, source. It's not used very often anymore, but I just tell you that there are different uh, types of reference styles. Now, the best thing to do, of course, is before you start writing your text, have a talk with your promoter, ask him what kind of reference style you should use. Uh, and then be consequent. If, if you start from the first paragraph in your text with the Harvard style, you have to finish your last senat sentence also be the Harvard style. So you cannot switch between, between styles. Um, there are manuals available about the different uh, reference styles also in English. And you can find them on uh, our community, Twee Bergen Bibliotheek Groep Wetenschap en Technologie. It's a Toledo commu community. Normally you should all uh, be able to access, access this uh, community. If not, you should contact us. Huh? So there you can find the manuals. Um, something about online materials. If you use uh, information you have found on a website, make sure that you always add the date that you access that website because they get updated during time. Uh, some uh, content can disappear or can be added in time. So it's very well, very um, important that you at the uh, access date in your reference. Also, if you find a digital object identifier, it's a unique identification number. If you should um, put this number or add it in or type it into in Google, you'll be always be able to trace this article. So in Web of Science, you can find, if you click on the title in your results list to have more information about uh, the reference, most of the time a digital object identifier is added for the particular articles. Now, um, if you have, um, you start reading quite a lot of articles and when, when you gather information for your master thesis, and of course, later on, if you, are, uh, you want to use that information, you have to know uh, or still have to find the reference of those original sources. And you can, of course, write down everything manually, but it will cost you quite a lot of time, time. So the best thing to do is to use reference management software. So it's a software package by which you can 
save your references uh, at one place. You can arrange them in different groups. You can share them with your colleagues. And it's also possible if you install a site while you write plugin, uh, that while you are writing your text, you immediately can insert your citations and the system will also start building up the bibliography at the end of the text. So it's a very uh, easy way uh, for managing your references. Um, there are different kinds and these are some questions you might consider before actually choosing for one. Um, desktop versions mostly are have to be paid. Um, these are the most uh, used, mostly used at university, so EndNote, Zotero, Mendeley. And today I'm going to show you EndNote online because it's free for you and I'm going to try to show it um, in live. So the best thing to access EndNote is to go to Web of Science, Limo, tap databases, remember, Web of Science, online access, you click on it and then you enter Web of Science. And then here underneath products, you find EndNote. If you already have an account for Web of Science, you can use it also for EndNote. If not, you have to register. Otherwise, you just sign in with your Web of Science account. Now, uh, here the first step, my references that, all, that are all the references that I have ever saved in EndNote. So it's uh, a whole list, eh? 768 references. And you can arrange them in groups. So this is the survey of my groups. There are groups shared by others. So uh, my groups, I have created them and I'm managing them. Eh? And groups shared by others, I'm not the manager, I just can have a look at those uh, references in those groups because someone else has allowed it uh, for me, has made me a member of that group. You can uh, search all those references by keywords. If you type in, for instance, here spin, then you get all the references that correspond to that keyword. You can see uh, lightened up here. Um, yeah, normally this list and all my references, I'm just going to show it again, um, is sorted in alphabetical order on the first author of the articles, but you can also change it. And what is can be useful is added to library newest to oldest. So in this way, the most recent uh, saved references are on top of your list. So if like today you were you have sent um, from Scopus, you have sent from EndNote, from maybe from Google Scholar, all kinds of references to EndNote, and you want to check if you really succeeded. So in this way, you can check it. Huh? Um, so you can add them from this list to all kinds of groups that you have created yourself, of course. It's just making a copy because the actual references will also stay in your list of all your references. So you just copy them to different groups. Um, yeah, if I just uh, look at uh, reference more closely, like here, for instance, you click on it and then you see uh, what reference type you're dealing with. So it's a journal article, you get the author, title field this has been filled out. So these bibliographic fields um, are all necessary to make your reference complete so that everybody, if he would like to, always would be able to trace this particular article. Um, there are also optional fields like abstracts. You can uh, add a digital object identifier and um, all kinds of things. Also some notes if you want to. But these should be filled out uh, correctly. Um, yeah. So, let me return to my list. Mm, from up systems here. Um, 
it, this here, this sign means uh, here you can uh, see in what kind of group uh, you have copied it. If you have a blue attachment here, attach tool or sign, that means that you have, like here, eh, that you have added some kind of attachment. It can be uh, an image, it can be the PDF of an article. So that's how it works. And you can also check for the full text of the article by the KU Leuven uh, link, eh, just like you did in Web of Science, to check if we, uh, if you can get access or download the full text of the article. This also works in EndNote. Eh? So like here, you can download your article PDF. Okay, now, how do you save um, references to EndNote? Well, because, um, EndNote is also a pro product from Clarivate Analytics as well as Web of Science is. So they're both products from Clarivate Analytics. Like uh, for Web of Science, it's very easy to, to save them. You just check uh, what kind of reference you want to save. And here on top of your list, you say export. And make sure that you choose for EndNote Online. And now you can define what you would like to have been saved in your record. Do you say, well, the author and the title of the article and also the title of the journal is okay for me, then the author title source is okay. If you would also like the abstract, you can, or the full record, you just choose it and you can export it. And you can also choose for all records of the page eh, in one time. Okay, so this is very well working. Now, if you, and very easy, if you, for instance, would like to uh, to save some references, some Scopus. Now, Scopus is not a product from uh, Clarivate Analytics, but from Elsevier, so it works a little bit away, but the way around. Um, yeah, I'm just going to do some kind of search whatever. And like if you would like to uh, export these two references, here on top you also have export, like you had an EndNote. But then you see, if you want to export it to EndNote, you first have to download this file of references on your uh, computer. So you choose for the RIS format, export, and you will see that's here downloaded on your computer. And later on, you will have to pick it up and save it in EndNote. Okay, but here underneath Collect, EndNote gives you more opportunities to uh, gather references. With online search, you can look through or search through uh, different catalogs from, from libraries all over the world, and also some databases. Just have a look at them and maybe copy some to your fa some to your favorites so that you don't have to select from the big list. Eh? So you only get the short list here. And for instance, if I uh, would like to have a look at the catalog of the Technical University of Helsinki, I just fill out here, I choose whatever field, and I, I fill out my keyword. And normally standard, it will select a range of records to retrieve. And maybe the best thing to do is leave it this way, because if you retrieve all records, and there are more than 500, hypothetically, but it's possible, then you cannot stop the procedure anymore. So you check for uh, uh, these um, records about nanotubes in this uh, catalog, and you've got, uh, you retrieved 84. So you can have a look at them, and if they're interesting for you, you check them and you immediately uh, can send them to one of your groups. Um. Okay. Now, also under Collect, you have this tab, New Reference, and this is for adding references to EndNote manually. 
So I always give this example if um, you were abroad and you attended a conference proceeding over there and you bring along the printed version of the, of the proceedings or the papers of the conference, um, then you can uh, fill out all the necessary fields here to describe a complete reference of your proceedings and you can add it also to EndNote. Now here you have to check for the reference type and you have a type for conference proceedings for all kinds of, of uh, sources that you will use. So I check here for conference proceedings and you see that the system will ask you also for the conference name, conference location, so all the fields that you should fill out uh, to make it uh, this reference complete and you can also add it to EndNote then. Import references, this is the tool that you need if you have to import references that you first had to download in RIS format on your computer, like is for the Scopus references and also for Google Scholar references. So you choose your file, here it is from today, and then you have to select an imp uh, import option and there are also <laughs> Uh, There's also a li very large list, so just check what you think you will be needing in future time. Now, if I have exported some references from uh, EndNote, uh, from Scopus, sorry, I think the best thing to do is also to choose the Scopus import version. And in this way, you can also immediately uh, send them to one of your uh, groups. Okay, now I've told already quite a lot about groups. Eh? Um, here underneath organize, you will, be on the manage my groups, you will be able to start a new group. So to create a new group, you just give it a name, click on okay, and you've got it. Uh, here you also have the survey of of the groups that you have created with the number of references in it. You can rename it, you can later on um, delete it, and this sign means that I already have shared it with some colleagues, this group from Bias Systems. And how can you do that, share with your colleagues? You s click here on Manage uh, Sharing, start sharing this group, and you add the email addresses of your colleagues, but of course it um, normally has to be the KU Leuven uh, email address because um, when you start registering in, in Web of Science or in EndNote, the best thing to do is to use your KU Leuven email address. So, but anyway, the address that they are using, um, by which they have, which your colleagues have registered in EndNote, of course. Um, and you can give them rights if you say, well, I just allow them to have a look at my reference they I don't allow them to use them in their work, then you give them read-only rights. If you don't mind that they cite your sources or your references, use them in their text, and maybe also will be able to uh, adjust references or delete references, then you give them read and write rights. Um, yeah, Others groups that are uh, groups that I haven't created, but I am a member of it, uh, of uh, these groups. And you see, I only can have a look um, at, the, at the references. I cannot cite it. If I would like to cite them, well, here you can find the owner of the group and so that you can contact him, uh, him or her. Find duplicates. If you have saved quite a lot of uh, references from uh, um, exhaustive databases like, or very big databases like Scopus and Web of Science, and maybe also from Google Scholar or IEEE database, it's very well possible that you have saved uh, the same references twice or maybe even thrice. Uh, and so in this way, with uh, the find duplicates tool, you can um, delete the double ones. Manage attachments is a survey of all the attachments that you have ever attached to uh, a certain kind of reference, and you can download them here or you can delete them or whatever. Formatting, of course, uh, once you have written your text, 
Uh, you have to add your bibliography. So you uh, select your group of references and you pick out one of the bibliographic styles uh, and here you can see what kind of styles there, there all can be. Also, uh, it's very well possible that um, a scientific journal has its own citation style. So later on, maybe, after when you uh, are doing your doctoral thesis, and one of the assignments will be also to, um, to write some articles and to have them published in a scientific journal, maybe it's possible that you have to do it with a certain kind of reference style that is specific for that scientific journal. So just pick up the ones that are important for you. Like for instance, IEEE style, um, I'm going to show it just in plain text. You can save it, email it to your promoter maybe, or to colleagues. And by preview and print, normally you can have a look at this uh, bibliographic list. It's not going to take uh, too much of time. Maybe I can just take um, this Harvard style because numerical style I already uh, showed you in the presentation. But it's not working. So anyway, I will leave it to it. You can uh, try it yourself maybe at home, yeah. Yeah, uh, you mean the BibTeX format for bibliography. Yeah, I will show you later on. It's not in this um, tool, so uh, now it's, I'm just going to, do, to let it do its work. Maybe we can see it later on. I'm going to minimize it. Um, so with format paper, here, yeah. I think it's, taking its time. Or maybe first decide while you write plugin. I'm just going to explain it with, uh, you can install it in Word. And um, if it was okay, if the installation was complete, then you get this link EndNote here on top in your toolbar, you click on it so that you get a connection with EndNote. So in this way, you can cite your sources in your text while you're writing your text, and also the system will automatically um, start building up the bibliography. So, and you can choose one of your uh, favorite styles, so only those styles that you have selected in EndNote as your favorite ones. So you do not get the, the whole large list of all kinds of, of reference styles. Eh? Um, so I'm just going to show you how it works. You in you ha are uh, you have paraphrased um, uh, some paragraphs from an original text, and of course you have to refer to that text, uh, to original text in your text that you are writing. And in this way, so this is the IEEE um, version of the reference styles. And I have to insert a next citation like. For instance, this one, and you see that the system already also starts building up the bibliography. If I choose another style like Harvard, it's an author uh, year system. So you see the author in the text and the publication year, and the bibliography will be in alphabetical order of the family name of the author. You can edit citations, maybe adjust them or, uh, or delete them. So, this was for site while you write. I hope now this one is working. Mm. Maybe I just have to enter it again. So now you see again two products from Web of Science and Note. Maybe I should close some things here.
Maybe it's just an internet uh, technical issue. I don't know. Anyway, I also have my presentation. <laughs> so I'll do it that way then. Uh. So, um, uh, if you choose for the format tool, and uh, it's possible to use beep to choose for the the beep tech, um style. So this is the site value right plugin. I also added some um, exercises. Um, no, I'm still going to try it. Yeah. So I told you about all these things. I'm just going to have a look. Uh, site value right plugin. Mm. Yeah. So underneath options, you can change your password, your uh, email address, whatever you want. You can also find out how long your subscri subscription is still uh, going. So normally you have access to EndNote from the latest date that you have access to. So for, from now on, today, the 28th of October, I, you will get access to 28th of, um, of next year. There is still one thing that I have to tell you about the downloads. Um, you have EndNote click there, which is if you install it, you get a quicker access to the full text uh, of uh, your article. But you also have capture reference. And uh, ah, here it is again. OK. So format paper. This one. Uh, you can use if, um, like for instance, you didn't have the, the talk with your promoter at the beginning of, of when you start writing your text. And after a month, well, you start using, for instance, IEEE style. And after one month, your promoter tells you, well, no, no, you have to do it in the Harvard style. Then you pick up your text. And you with this tool, format paper, you can change it in another style. Export references, and this is um, the answer to your question about beep tech. So if you use export references, then you can um, export them into a beep tech. This is because some master engineering uh, students write their thesis in LaTeX, and then normally they have to add their bibliography written in beep tech. So options, I told you. Then downloads. Here's also this information about Site Value Right plugin. But also capture reference. You just pick it up and drag it to your toolbar. Why should you use it? It's for um, information from websites. So info like uh, if you're looking on the internet about nanotechnology, like for instance this here. And uh, you want to, to save it in EndNote. If you click on Capture Reference, then uh, the system starts building up the reference. Now I have to fill out my email address again. And the password. So it will choose the correct uh, reference type. Uh, it's a journal article that you find uh, on a website. But with this uh, tool, you really have to take care. You always have to check your references, uh, if they are really complete. Uh, uh, but with this is very basic, if you use the capture reference. So you should really take care, because there's no author, um, not a journal title. So you really have to take care have a close look uh, before you save it. Eh? That's really complete. OK, so I think that was the most important for EndNote. I added some exercises with, at the end of the presentation, also the solutions, which if you still would like to, uh, you can do at home. Um, yeah. 
So this is, uh, I told you, uh, there's also a slide about uh, downloading the bibliography in BibTech in the presentation. Now, um, at the website of ICTS, there's also a course text about LaTeX. And they also uh, organize some introduction courses. You can have a look at, I think it's uh, still one in November. You can have a look in the presentation uh, with this link. And also, uh, we as um, library staff have um, created a manual about BibTech. And you can also find it in the Tweebergen Bibliotheke Group Wetenschap and Technologie Community in Toledo. So also underneath the heading self-study material. And it's, it's uh, in Dutch and in English available. So you can have a look at it. If you still would like more general information about the whole procedure of information literacy from the beginning of uh, receiving a research question or a topic, till at the end delivering your text. Um, you can check our tutorial information that you'll see also on Toledo. And if you have a specific question about your thesis, we organize, this, uh, we organize two thesis cafes this year, the 7th of November and the 5th of December in the Agora Learning Center in the center of Leuven and eh, center of town. And um, you can go there yourself, so you go there live, but you can also attend it online. The only thing that you have to do is uh, enroll um, via Toledo. Yeah. So anyway, if you still have questions, uh, it's quite a lot of information. You can always contact us at onderwijs2bergen at kaileuven.be. Uh, also, if you're not able to access those uh, Toledo communities that I showed you in the presentation. Okay. So I hope I'm still on time. And um, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, wish you all the success with your master thesis. So thank you. <laughs>